Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Samuel Seaman, Professor of Decision Sciences in the Grazia Dio School of Business and Management, and this is the Grazia Dio Business Review. I'm here today with a special guest, Dr. Theodore Roosevelt Malik, Chairman and Founder of the Spiritual Enterprise Institute, as well as Chairman and CEO of the Roosevelt Group, a leading strategy thought leadership company. He's a research professor at Yale University and a prolific author. Ted, thank you for being with us this afternoon. It's great to be in Malibu any, any afternoon. Well, uh, I'd like to begin, Ted, with uh, something that you mentioned early on in the book. You talk of spiritual capital, and you say that spiritual capital uh, allows a business or changes a business for the better. Can you share with our viewers a little bit more about what you mean by spiritual capital and and how it changes businesses for the better. Well, this this concept of spiritual capital is something that we're evolving and thinking about. Bob Putnam, who's a, of course a major social scientist at Harvard University, has has written for two decades or more about social capital. And he argues that about half of all of social capital emanates from a, a religious experience or a religious organization or a religious institution, not a one type or another, but uh, in, in the U.S. about half of all social capital is of religious in nature. So I think that deserves special attention and I call that spiritual capital. So it's the fund of knowledge, the fund of information, the fund of uh, beliefs that are handed down generation to generation that actually come from some transcendental source, some religious bearing. And it so happens that, uh, of course, these religious inklings from the very beginning of the American Republic have founded things like schools and universities and seminaries and hospitals and voluntary associations of all kinds and sorts, but they've also been very important in the establishment of business. So we're trying to actually record and research what that looks like. Um, you also mentioned that um, good bin businesses can create wealth by virtuous means. Is it possible for companies to satisfy their obligations to shareholders and, and still conduct business by virtuous means? Well, I, I think it is. It's uh, implicit in, in a kind of um, morality of the market. Adam Smith argued uh, you know, some centuries ago that without that uh, kind of sympathy, without that kind of benevolence, without that kind of uh, virtue, that capitalism itself was not possible. So you can sustain a business over a short term uh, using the opposite of virtue, uh, and you could probably do quite well, but over a longer period of time, I think that uh, practicing virtue is actually not just good business, which it is, that means for all of the stakeholders, but it's also very profitable for the shareholders. Are there special considerations that the management team should consider uh, if they want to truly incorporate these virtues and uh, this business by virtue in a publicly traded company? Indeed. I mean, a lot of people say, well, that would be great for a mom and pop company or maybe in a small, medium sized enterprise, but suppose you actually became a big company, public or private, or as you say, it became a publicly traded company. Would that be something you could sustain? And in our research, uh, we found that there are many companies, in fact, not just a few, that have this kind of uh, spiritual capital as their DNA. And it takes many different forms. I don't want to say that it's uniform, that there's some standard practice or that there are some best practices that you must do. It really is a multiplicity of things. Uh, and what we're looking at in our research is uh, what some of those are and how they've evolved over the years and we're trying to orient that discussion around different virtues. And uh, for instance, I mean, because you're always going to want to, for instance, at a, at a major company like Herman Miller, which is a furniture manufacturing company based in Western Michigan, you have a company that um, grew out of a kind of reformed Protestant tradition, and they have a very strong sense of stewardship. So they also have an element there that I think categorizes the company every year. They're on the most uh, admired company list but the virtue of respect and the way they actually treat their employees, that would involve all kinds of decision making, all kinds of participation. It also involves compensation, which is quite fascinating. Now, could that be replicated in another company in some rote fashion? No, 
but could we learn some things and some lessons that other companies would take and actually manu manufacture their own kind of orientation? I think yes. So an important term I heard in there was this notion of virtue. and. Uh, some, uh, many of my colleagues worry that the notion of virtue uh, and virtuous business is lost on contemporary society. And, and despite uh, you know, writing about virtue for ages, it seems like we keep falling into the same traps and the media has made much of business failures of late and, and uh, immorality well, in business. So we have, no, we have no shortage of scandal or yes. of... Uh, Tobacco or uh, of Madoff schemes, or so-called Ponzi schemes. Uh, I uh, would say that that is uh, a very strong part of the built, uh, you know, kind of business uh, uh, culture today. But it is by no means the majority of businesses. Uh, it does make for a very good news story, and it is a very real phenomenon. Uh, but the majority of businesses are actually run on very different basis, and I would argue a more virtuous basis. And we need to look at that. In psychology, if you want to take a, a, a field that's quite far away, you know, for years and years, for decades, the study of psychology was all, all about abnormal, uh, abnormal behavior and dysfunctionality. In the last two decades, thanks largely to Marty Seligman and his colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, you have this new school of psychology called positive psychology, which looks at good behaviors. You could argue looking at virtuous behavior to see how people might actually behave. I think the same kind of study of business, looking at positive behaviors and looking at virtue, could give us some interesting corresponding uh, material. So, uh, particularly for our academic viewers, uh, do you have some ideas how we might instill virtue in our students, how, how we might teach them, rather than just giving them something to read and, and say this is a good book? Mm -hmm. There's some things we can do to instill virtue. Well, it, it's, uh, it's a classic question. It's a perennial question. It's one that uh, I guess uh, some students have lost. I've had students, uh, even at prestigious Ivy League universities, ask me the question, what is virtue? Uh, they clearly haven't gone to Sunday school. They haven't gotten some of these values in their families. They haven't read about them in certain business literature, so there is a bit of a vacuum. I think uh, one thing we can do, and I certainly do uh, emphasize, as you, the rereading of the classics, but uh, I think we, we need to write more cases. If we're teaching business uh, cases, and we are largely in business schools, then we need some more cases that uh, would um, specify where these virtues have been evidenced, how they've been tested, and whether they're replicable. So one of the things we're doing is writing 24 new case studies, very, very detailed, highly interactive case studies, which students, particularly MBA students, could use then as a point of reference. Uh, okay, so in your book and in, in the PBS documentary that we aired last evening, um, you have a long list of virtues. Uh, but in the book, you, you specifically begin with the virtues of business. Can you identify some of the what you feel might be some of the most fundamental of the virtues of business and then give some examples of companies or company leaders perhaps that exemplify and exhibit those behaviors? Well, indeed, I, I can do that, and I've done that in hundreds and hundreds of pages and uh, long uh, videos, so to do it uh, very succinctly is, is sometimes more difficult than doing it in, uh, in long book treatments. But uh, I argue that there are, uh, and, and this discussion about virtues and virtue ethics is something that we're trying to revive. So for hundreds of years, it's sort of fallen out of favor, so we're trying to bring it back. Uh, but the, the discussion of which virtues and which orbit and which priority is something that's very interesting to me. Uh, I argue, uh, as others have, that there are the four uh, ancient uh, virtues, the so-called virtues of the polis that have been with us for uh, thousands of years. Of course, uh, Socrates and Plato, and particularly Aristotle, articulated them well. Uh, temperance, courage, perseverance, uh, those kinds of virtues. And then uh, in our own Christian experience, there are the uh, 
three virtues of the uh, of the monastery or of the cathedral: faith, hope, and charity. And if you put the four and the three together, which is a kind of synthesis, and Thomas performed that synthesis, so we don't have to perform it again. But if we look at that. Uh, we'd have uh, the seven virtues, and maybe there's some modern ones we could add on to that, and I do that in my book on leadership and other virtues, but uh, we could have that debate about which virtues, but just having that discussion about virtue is, I think, the important starting point. Uh, and then you'd look for examples around the world in different faith traditions and different companies that give evidence to those kinds of virtues. So uh, that's, in fact, what we do in this PBS documentary where we interview 14 major company CEOs and we uh, they come from about seven different eight different faith traditions so that's interesting in and of itself and when we, we, we try to highlight the virtue that is most evident in that company so a company like for instance Cargill which is the world's largest uh, privately held company about a hundred and twenty billion dollar company uh, the virtue of leadership based on the principle that has been present in that company for over 150 years, uh, our word is our bond. And then how that gets worked out in the various leadership structures and practices, things they do, uh, even in the philanthropic activities of a company like Cargo, very interesting to look at. And very positive, I think, for students to study. And then some would say that uh, very often in business we move from one fad to the other. Do you think that this rebirth of interest in virtue, virtuous business behavior, is a fad? And if not, what, what is the evidence that it has staying power? Well, I think it's, it's a discussion that human beings have had for uh, about three to 5,000 years. So as long as there's been written communications, even oral communications, we've had this perennial discussion about what is the good life uh, in the corporate setting, what is the good company. So I, I don't think it's a fad. I think that it, uh, it does ebb and, and flow. Uh, clearly there are periods when uh, scandals that would bring in the next wave of, of interest. Uh, we're certainly in the middle of one of those presently, so my writing is contributing to that. I would uh, attest to that. I think that there is, though, in this generation of students, a very keen interest uh, just coming what they've come through, looking at the financial crisis, looking at uh, some of the political surrounding uh, that um, that uh, we could actually form a, a better kind of company in the future. So it's not just an issue, uh, some would make it an issue of corporate social responsibility. I would say it's a much broader and wider swath than that. Um, do you see a role for altruism uh, in this discussion of business by virtuous means? I mean, and by that I mean um, doing something where there, it's not targeted philanthropy, so there, there's no expected payback. It's mm -hmm. just done for, for good. Well, in, indeed, I think that, uh, and I've written an entire book on the virtue of generosity, wh which, is, um, which is worth uh, highlighting. Uh, lots of uh, philanthropists uh, have, um, have made their wealth in a corporate setting and then decided you know, to, to give it back or to give it back over a period of time. There are ways to do that. I think that's very positive. There are other companies that have structured different business models that are constantly giving back. Uh, there are others that, uh, that uh, have different kinds of profit sharing or gain sharing schemes that in a sense are giving back as well, largely to the employees or to the communities in which they do business. So I think there's no one answer to that question. I think it's an important one. Uh, and I think that uh, companies that practice that kind of altruism, that kind of what I would call generosity, are companies that are viewed much more favorably by the public. So there is a kind of reputation capital, if you will, that surrounds that kind of doing good. Um. I mentioned last evening that a colleague and I have looked at using narrative to um, discuss or talk about virtue and instill virtue in students. Can you think of any narratives that are especially helpful for you uh, in, ter in terms of trying to identify these virtues and, and share these virtues with others? 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that you're doing that here. Uh, there are a few other business schools that are you know, experimenting with similar kinds of schemes. I was involved for years with the Aspen Institute, so I'm part of the great books tradition. Uh, so those great books have been sometimes uh, shortened into great paragraphs or great sentences because we don't have enough time to read the entire books today. But I'm very sympathetic to the view of reading literature, to reading biblical literature and other religious literature, to reading uh, the plays of Shakespeare or reading more recent novels, uh, short stories, even poetry, to help us uh, get at some of these bigger perennial questions, and they certainly have business implications. Uh, so they're themes that can be amplified. Uh, I uh, use some of that kind of literature in, in courses that I teach as well, and uh, I find that particularly useful when you're dealing with business executives who have very shortened telegraph amounts of time, and if they can read something of, of an abbreviated nature that um, it doesn't have to be a business case or a business story or a financial set of uh, tables, uh, a quantitative study. It can be something very different outside of their normal orbit and it will actually put them into a mode that lets them think about new things or look at things in a fresh perspective. Can, can you think of one or two specific pieces that, that, that you've used that have been particularly helpful? Well, we have used uh, some of the parables, actually, huh. of Jesus, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the parable of the talents, among others. And when people read them who uh, maybe, you know, witnessed some of that in, in an earlier stage in their life or, uh, you know, heard them in a pew some Sunday, but they actually read them and study them, uh, they come to a, a different kind of appreciation. We also, uh, and I, I uh, like to reread classic pieces of literature, so again, they're period pieces, whether it's Adam Smith's different uh, arguments in The Wealth of Nations, or in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, or his argument about the pin factory and how uh, uh, you know, the division of labor takes place, or it's Billy Budd reading a, you know, a, a, a modern kind of novel-esque story. Uh, it helps people, I think, break through uh, some kinds of business paradigms and business thinking that otherwise uh, they don't get to. Um, and I've heard uh, through your answers and uh, throughout the documentary last evening, there seems to be this common thread of a, a, a faith background in, uh, for, of the founders of many of these firms. What role do you think faith plays in, in a virtuous business? Well, I, I think it plays a, a very prominent role. Uh, I'm, I, I wouldn't argue that it's the only means to virtue. Uh, I, I think that there are other philosophical orientations that can lead to virtue. Uh, and, and reading uh, Greek philosophy in particular is, is useful for that argument. We're writing some case studies on companies as far away as uh, India, where Zoroastrianism gave rise to the Tata Empire, or where a form of Hinduism gave rise to the very large uh, new uh, companies like Infosys, uh, or Confucian companies in, in, in China, Islamic companies in different parts of the uh, Islamic world. So uh, I think that uh, in, in many cases, not just in North America or certainly in Western Europe, Religion has had a very, very uh, prominent role in uh, bringing certain companies into existence. People of faith have been entrepreneurial and have used their uh, religious traditions to actually help birth companies. I say, I use the phrase that a lot of this is, uh, is present at the founding in a kind of a DNA, and it gets shaped into the very structure of the company, uh, what the vision is, what the values are and how they do business. And uh, some of these companies have lived on, and that's a very interesting statement in and of itself, for hundreds of years, and largely because of those traditions. I'm writing an article right now with some colleagues uh, in Britain at um, Judge Business School at Cambridge University. We have an argument, I'll try it out on you, uh, that on High Street in Britain, they don't have the same kind of shopping malls that we're used to in America, but in High Street, in almost every British city, you have a dozen or more shops of some prominence, uh, uh, Whitsmith's, Cadbury's, Barclays Bank, uh, 
go down the list, they're all there. And if you go back and look, they're all about 175 to 200 years old. And they all grew out of a nonconformist, that's non-Anglican, nonconformist or Quaker background. And they've been very, very significant in, in British history. And they've had this uh, sustainability, this durability. Use Jim Collins' I fray, commonly used phrase, they've been built to last, and these have lasted a long time. And that's largely because of those religious values that were undergirding them. Mm -hmm. so it's a fascinating story. Not an American one, but present in another society. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's an interesting example. Um, some would say that if it's legal, it's ethical, or if it's legal, it's virtuous. How do you respond to that? Well, I think that the rule of law is certainly very imp important in, in democratic capitalism. So. Uh, I, I would not uh, dismiss the, the role of law and, and what is uh, what is legal. Uh, I, I think that uh, the rule of love also comes into play, and sometimes you have to have a higher kind of business calling, if you will. And some people have written about that very eloquently. Bill Pollard's book on the soul of the firm, for instance, uh, uh, you know, list a number of others. So that uh, uh, sometimes the law gives us the bare minimum. Uh, which is a floor that we have to respect. And in some societies, that floor doesn't exist. So when we have it, we actually have to applaud it. But uh, I think it's helpful to go well beyond. Uh, you mentioned faith, hope, and love, hope, faith, hope, and charity. Yeah. I'm intrigued by those. How do they manifest themselves in, in, companies. in business and yeah, in companies? So in, in, in a myriad of ways, uh, uh, a company like Service Master, just mentioned Bill, uh, of course was CEO for a dozen years there, but it's uh, had a longer duration than him, and uh, is actually still in existence. It's a com combination of many smaller firms into Service Master, but their core value is to honor God. So faith is at the, at the very core of their mission, and they have uh, a tradition there which comes out of the Robert Greenleaf kind of orientation of leadership called Servant Leadership which uh, some of your students, I'm sure, appreciate. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a notion that was very powerful in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, and a number of companies found sympathy with it. A couple of universities did as well, and they shaped themselves around that concept, um, which is a very biblical notion. In the case of, uh, uh, of hope, I mean, I think uh, business is largely about taking risks and the role of an entrepreneur. So. You don't find a lot of really pessimistic people going into business. They're all rather hopeful about both the medium and the long term. That's what gives them the confidence to do what they do, to step out. I mean, that's the whole notion and the whole definition of an entrepreneur, just uh, obviously to, to, take, uh, to take the risk to raise the rent, if you will. Uh, so there is a hopefulness about business that's, it's really, uh, it's interesting when you study entrepreneurs, and we have done that. In, in cases of hundreds of entrepreneurs, you find that almost as a predominant element, as a, that, that, that view of the future that they can make a difference, that either some product that they're bringing to market or some technology that they're bringing to market or some new service is really going to change the way things are. So you find that uh, usually the founding of, of all kinds of companies, very fascinating. And then charity, I mean, we've already talked about that. Um, I like it structured in many different ways, but uh, Corporate giving and uh, f uh, families of wealth uh, actually contribute a great deal to society. Uh, so I have an argument that's a larger argument, uh, kind of a, a cycle of virtue. Uh, it sounds a little bit like Adam Smith because it's probably borrowed from Adam Smith. But unless we create and generate wealth, and unless we save and invest part of that wealth, we really wouldn't have anything to give away. So you have to do that at the beginning. You have to create the wealth, save and invest that wealth so that over the long term you can actually be generous. And um, I think that companies uh, that are sustained, that are good companies, have that conception. Now whether that's structured into the company and into the shareholder agreement, or whether, say, the Gates kind of formula, it's uh, something that is done in a, in a kind of dualistic way. In other words, the company does well, then Bill takes his money out and forms his own foundation. That's maybe a more traditional pattern, but it's still a very 
very powerful phenomenon for good in the world. Um, I asked this question last night. I'll try it in a different way. Um, are there occasions where virtue, if misapplied, can can lead to vice? And by that I mean, are, are there situations where companies started out with great intentions to, to mm -hmm. be virtuous, yeah. and it's led to um, outcomes that they weren't? Well, we, we know that's the case. So, uh, like in a human life, you, know, you can have uh, people that are either too zealous or uh, fall prey to <laughs> some temptation. So that is certainly the case in corporations as well. I mean, the, the most recent ones that come to mind are Enron and WorldCom, which weren't bad companies. I mean, Ken Lay was a, a very strong Baptist who made all kinds of faith pronouncements at the beginning of Enron and actually uh, put that at the core of the company. But as it grew and he brought other people in who had different intentions and did things off the balance book and took all kinds of risks that weren't really either legal or ethical, the company got into massive problems. So there was a uh, a, a temptation in a sense to uh, grow too fast or to do too much. And I, th I think that that is, um, you know, it's always part of the business temptation. Yeah, and then you mention in the book, uh, and this may be related, uh, that uh, the virtues have to be tempered. So we, ha we really have to strike a balance. If you have too much courage, that can lead to aggression. And Obviously. And yeah. So, well, yeah. this is an, Aristot uh, an Aristotelian notion right. about the. Uh, you know, the mean, you know, the virtue itself uh, has to be tempered, right? So, and you could have a company that, uh, you know, say exhibited only one virtue and did that to excess, it would maybe not be profitable, therefore it would go out of business, or it would be excessive in another sense and it would actually fall on its face. So you have to know how to balance all these things in an orbit, I say. Uh, but it's not unlike personal life, right? True. Well, I've enjoyed talking with you and asking my questions. Do you have any last thoughts that you might? Well, I, I wanted to say one more thing about uh, one of the larger projects that we're working on presently that I think your your business students in particular would be interested in. With the European Academy of Business, presently we are uh, we've just inaugurated a three-year study of the six great faith traditions in the world and their practical wisdom for management. So I would like the students in particular to be on the lookout for the Journal of uh, Management Development, which is dedicating uh, one issue over the next uh, three years to each of the faith traditions. So the first one on Christianity was just finished in September. Um, we're holding these conferences amongst leading academics and practitioners to bring forward this kind of practical wisdom, which I think is very timely and needed a world of global commerce. Excellent. I hope our students will be on the lookout for that. Well, Ted, thank you very much for being yeah. with us this afternoon. And thank you for joining us for this video interview of the Grazia Dio Business Review. For more of the latest research and analysis on business and management, visit gbr.pepperdine.edu. Thank you.